So welcome everybody. I'm Sarah McMillan. I'm Director of Impact and Engagement with NCT. I'm so grateful and really delighted to have such a brilliant um, group of people for this conversation today, really to talk about the latest guidance and information for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding about the COVID-19 vaccine. We know that the vaccine programme is progressing at speed um, and as it's reaching the, the younger age groups, there are more and more women who are pregnant and breastfeeding being offered the vaccine and understandably having lots of questions um, about to help them make a decision around it. So it would be wonderful if everyone could introduce themselves. So Pat, would you like to go first? Hello, yes, I'm Pat O'Brien. I'm an obstetrician and I'm vice president of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And along with my Royal College of Midwife colleague, Mary Ross Davey, uh, co-chair the vaccine group uh, within the colleges. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Pat. And Pavan? So my name is Dr. Pavan Minhas. I'm a registrar in obstetrics and gynaecology, and um, I'm also a doctor on social media where I raise awareness on a number of women's health issues. I've been speaking a lot about the COVID-19 vaccine and providing accessible information for women on my platform. Brilliant, thank you. And Gertrude? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Gaitri Amadalingam. I'm a consultant epidemiologist uh, based in the National Immunisation Team at Public Health England and really great to be here to uh, participate in this conversation today. Thank you. Thanks. And Jacqueline? Hello, my name's Jacqueline Dunkley Bent. I'm Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS in England, uh, practicing midwife and delighted to be here to have a conversation with you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. I wonder if it's worth starting, Pat, by, by giving a quick summary of what the current um, guidance is for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Sure. Well, the current advice now is that pregnant women should be offered the vaccine at the same time as the rest of the population based on their age and clinical risk group. Um, and that's rolling out as we speak. And with regard to breastfeeding, there's no known uh, risk to having the vaccine in breastfeeding. So it's advised that if uh, the offer comes and you're breastfeeding, uh, you should take it the same as anybody else. And I'd just like to add, actually, Sarah, um, to, to Pat, that the benefits of breastfeeding far outweigh any risk. So please do, don't have any hesitancy about continuing to breastfeed your baby. Thank you, Jacqueline. That feels a really important point because we do know people do worry about continuing and medication. So really important to get that, to get that information out. Um, we've had a specific question from Georgia about the evidence on which um, the guidance is currently based. Um, so specifically around um, the guidance being based on evidence from the US and uh, not yet being tested specifically in the UK. So I wondered, Gayatri, if you could just say a little bit about the evidence the guidance is based on and why people should have confidence in that. Sure, thanks, Sarah. So I think just to start, um, in terms of the recommendations and advice um, around the vaccination programme in the UK, this is based on expert advice from the UK's um, Expert Advisory Committee on Immunisation, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, or JCVI, and they regularly review um, evidence from um, a range of different sources, uh, whatever is available from across the globe, because we're learning um, all the time in terms of um, the safety and effectiveness of these vaccines. So it's really important that the JCBI considers all the available evidence when making its um, advice to the UK government and ensure that um, the UK population is protected as much as it can be. And so it's not unusual um, for the UK uh, JCBI to consider evidence from other countries. And given the fact that the um, US has probably the largest experience of using COVID vaccines in pregnant women, um, it would seem completely um, appropriate and important that we consider that evidence when taking on advice for the UK population. And in the US, we know that more than 100,000 uh, women in pregnancy have received this vaccine particularly the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines um, during pregnancy. And all the evidence so far is showing that these are safe vaccines for pregnant women and provide important protection for these women as well. So it's on that basis that JCBI have updated their advice last month to recommend, as Pat has said, uh, that women should receive this vaccine and be offered this vaccine um, at the same time as their counterparts based on age or risk group. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, and we have had a few questions related to that, specifically about safety for babies. And um, Pat, I wondered if you wanted to add anything about the evidence around babies. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, at the start, when this broke out, we were quite concerned that, you know, like SARS and MERS, that this virus might harm babies in the womb. Um, but thankfully, the more evidence that we've accumulated, the less likely that seems to be. Now, having said that, it, it is true that if you're pregnant, especially in the last trimester, so after 28 weeks of pregnancy, and you do get COVID, it's a little bit more likely that you might get severe COVID. Uh, that's for the mother. And if that happens, it's a bit more likely that it might become necessary to deliver the baby uh, just so the treatment of the mother can be uh, optimized. Uh, and of course, then the baby uh, is exposed to the risk of being born a bit premature. So the risks of these things are not high, but they're important. Uh, and a study published just last week from the National Maternity and Perinatal Audit, along with the RCOG, uh, showed that there is also seems to be in women who have the virus at the time of, of birth, there seems to be a doubling of the risk of stillbirth. Now, the absolute numbers are very small. I want to reassure people, but it does seem to increase the risk of stillbirth if you get this virus, especially towards the end of pregnancy. So what I would say is that having the vaccine protects you, the mother, against uh, in, uh, serious, becoming seriously unwell, uh, but it also helps to protect your baby against the risk of stillbirth and of being born premature. Thank you. And... Jacqueline, a question for you. We've had um, a mum called Amy get in touch who's 22 weeks pregnant and she had the AstraZeneca um, vaccine earlier this year, actually before the guidance changed and um, before she found out she was pregnant. And at the time she was advised not to go and have the second vaccine. And now obviously the guidance has changed and she's wondering what her position is. Should she be going to get the second vaccine? Um, should she be worrying about the interval being longer than 10 to 12 weeks? Um, and um, what's being advised about switching type of vaccine uh, between that first and second dose as well? That's a great question um, from Amy and totally understand why she has those concerns. Um, so it's recommended that women receive the same vaccine for both doses. And as you've clearly, Amy, already received the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, if you didn't experience any serious side effects, then you should continue to receive a second dose. You've no need to start all over again if there's been a longer interval than you would have liked uh, in between taking the vaccine. Uh, please do continue to speak to your midwife, to your GP or your maternity team, and they will encourage you to take the second dose. Thank you. And would anyone on the panel like to add any other any other information around that? I know there's been some questions we've heard and we've heard through social media around the interval, but particularly whether to avoid the first trimester or how close into the third trimester is advised. So I wonder if someone would like to speak to that point. Well, can I pick that up? Yeah, I mean, based on the, the data from the States, which is considerable now, as Guy was just saying, that um, there is no evidence that having the vaccine, even in the first trimester, is harmful for the baby. And there isn't any theoretical way in which it could be harmful either. Now, having said that, you know, we acknowledge that many women feel, you know, that the first 12 weeks are a time where the baby is a bit more vulnerable to insults, whether that's infection or drugs or things like that. Uh, so some women might want to wait until after 12 weeks, but there's no evidence to suggest that that's necessary. But certainly if people feel more comfortable doing that, then that's fair enough. Mm. And Pavan, I wondered if you wanted to add anything at that stage about the questions that you've been hearing through your social media platforms you mentioned earlier and um, any general messages or information for women who may still be feeling a bit uh, confused or concerned around any of the information. Yeah, so I think it's understandable that women are feeling slightly confused and apprehensive about having the vaccine. We understand that the guidance over time has evolved and changed as we have collated more evidence to guide us. Um, but I think the point that I'd really like to highlight and, and I also highlight on my social media platform is that it's really important to have an open discussion with your healthcare professional so that a risk assessment can take place as to what's best in your circumstances and for you to essentially make a really informed decision because what's right for one individual will be very different to what's right for another it will depend on a number of factors for example what you do for work whether you're in a high risk of exposure environment whether you have any underlying health conditions and I think that there, there should be no judgment in these conversations and I think that every question is a valid question to ask and again, it's an informed decision that you have to make yourself. 
um, based on what's right for you and there should be no pressure but we're just here to advise you and to give that evidence base so that you can make your decision. And um, the only other thing that I would say is that it's really important to use reputable um, resources for educating yourself on what's best for you. So the resources that I always recommend to people are the RCOG. They have a Q&A section on their website, which offers really fantastic advice. It's really clear and really you know, easy to access. Public Health England also have information on their website as well. So I would start from that point um, and also discuss with your GP, midwife or obstetrician so that you can make your right decision. That's fabulous. Thank you so much. Such a helpful uh, message for everyone to hear. Vera, if I could just um, add something, if that's okay, just in terms of the intervals, because I know Amy was asking specifically about concerns around mm -hmm. that. I think we're now seeing growing evidence um, emerging. I think it's something that we would anticipate, knowing how vaccines work, that actually um, leaving a longer interval provides um, actually better protection in terms of antibody responses. So I don't think Amy needs to be concerned if her interval between her first and second doses has lengthened beyond sort of the, the recommended schedule. I think she just still needs to um, go ahead and um, discuss as, as, um, as Jacqueline's already said about the um, options for her, but that shouldn't um, preclude her or concern her that she's not going to get the optimal protection from that second dose. And the reason for completing the schedule is actually providing that longer term protection. We know you get very good protection from that first dose of vaccine, but to provide additional protection and longer term protection, it's really important women come forward for their second dose as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. So before we finish, I would like to invite you all to share any final messages or information, anything you think we might have missed today, but any key messages you'd, you'd like to share with women who are listening. Jacqueline, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I would just like to encourage uh, any uh, woman who is pregnant, thinking about becoming pregnant or indeed have had their baby, um, speaking directly to you, be encouraged that we are confident with the evidence that we have at the moment that having the vaccination is absolutely safe and the benefits of the vaccine far outweigh any of the risks. So a, a real encouragement that if you are concerned and there are many concerns and many myths about the vaccine, please do speak to your midwife, your obstetrician, your maternity team, your GP or a trusted health professional, and they will give you the encouragement, the further encouragement that you need to take the right step into having the vaccination. Thank you so much. Pat, is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, thank you. I, a lot of women say I'm, I'm a bit concerned about having the vaccine because it might harm my baby. Uh, and I think I would say that there's, there's no theoretical way that the vaccine could harm the baby. Uh, at the moment, with all that data from the States, there's no evidence that the vaccine harms the baby. Um, and on the other hand, if you look at what COVID can do, COVID, if you get it during pregnancy, can increase the risk to your baby. So I would say, you know, put, put aside your concerns about your own health, but just if you're considering the pros and cons from the baby's point of view, I would say have the vaccine. Thank you. And Gayatri? Yeah, I mean, I think I would um, only just sort of concur with what's already been said and just to remind women that really these vaccines are highly effective. We know that they've actually saved thousands of lives. Um, the latest evidence is showing that um, more than 13,000 lives have been prevented or saved from these vaccines in older um, age groups in this population. Lots of um, people have been prevented from going into hospital. So we know that this um, is, are highly effective vaccines. And I think it's uh, worth reminding um, women that this is not a live vaccine, so it doesn't contain the live virus, so it can't infect you or your unborn child. So there's no reason why this should, that you know, there should be any safety concerns around this. So we are now seeing growing evidence, as Pat has already said, from uh, the United States of the safety of these vaccines. So really encourage women to seriously consider, think carefully about your situation and um, look at all the available resources, um, as has already been said, um, when making those decisions for both for yourself and for your baby. Thank you. Thank you. And Pavan? I think I would just agree with the rest of the panel. I think they've beautifully summarised the key points and the key messages. Um, once again, please don't believe the myths. Look at the evidence and make your decision based on that um, rather than the myths that are out there and circulating because it's unsafe to go by them. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, everyone. You've, you've, you've really helped with such clear information and messaging for women and their families who are, who are listening um, to this. So really appreciate your input today. Um, everybody's referred to brilliant sources of, of reliable evidence-based information on the Royal College of Office and Gynae website, Royal College of Midwives, Public Health England, and you can find the links to all of that information via the NCT uh, website as well. So once again, just a huge thank you to our panel. Many thanks indeed. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.